Colorado's largest school district is going to wait. Denver Public Schools isn't going to in-person classes right away. District announced about an hour ago that instead what it's going to do is start the school year with two weeks of remote learning, and then they're going to reassess whether to stay out of school buildings for another two weeks after that. You can see how this could become indefinite. My colleague Chris Vanderveen rightly noted today that there is nothing in the COVID-19 numbers that suggests that Denver or Colorado in general will be in a better spot after two weeks. So parents be warned, this could be a longer term remote situation in DPS or in other school districts. Ah, Weld County, larger in landmass than the states of Rhode Island and Delaware combined and more COVID-19 cases than the entire states of Montana or Wyoming, or Alaska, or Vermont. Yet today, Weld County's Republican commissioners announced that its health department will not be enforcing the statewide mask mandate. They say Democratic Governor Jared Polis does not have the authority to require people to wear masks in public indoor spaces. Now, that statewide mask mandate does have exemptions for people who have medical conditions that won't allow them to wear a mask. But you can't just refuse to wear one and say that you've got freedomitis. Here's our new Roy. Anyone over 10 going in and moving around in public indoor spaces is mandated to wear a mask. Same goes for people using or waiting for public buses, the light rail, taxis and ride shares. The governor's executive order cites several studies that show how masks can reduce infection rates. But today we're focusing on questions around the caveats, specifically health related exemptions like breathing problems and people who can't remove a mask by themselves. Several doctors say this list is very short. Lung disease could be argued either way, that it could make it more difficult to wear a mask or make a mask more necessary. Cognitive impairment and abnormal facial anatomy could warrant talking to your doctor about what you should do. The CDC said some people who are deaf or hard of hearing may rely on lip reading to communicate, but also pointed out that clear face coverings are available. People with intellectual and developmental disabilities may have a harder time wearing masks too, as well as people with some mental health concerns. A few examples are anxiety and PTSD. Dr. Ben Miller with Mental Health Colorado said it's not about physically wearing the mask, but that it could be a trigger for some people. He says for people who can access help, some might be able to manage with the right treatment. We asked several agencies how all of this will work. Jefferson County said they are working off the honor system when it comes to navigating medical exemptions and expects the community to do the right thing when it comes to wearing masks. So the governor's office said the idea here is not to question people's medical conditions, but to encourage people to go to the doctor and ask, hey, is there a different kind of mask I could use that might work better for you? And of course, if you are considered vulnerable for COVID-19, the state is still encouraging people to stay at home. So with that said, if you need help getting groceries, other necessities, you can still call 211 and they should be able to help connect you to resources to help you get those groceries and the things that you need day to day, Kyle. So, Anusha, sometimes it's difficult to tell if there really are a lot of people or jurisdictions that are opposed to the mask order or whether there are just a few that are really noisy, you know? Hmm. Yeah, so uh, there are 39 counties and municipalities that already had mask orders at a local level in place before the governor's announcement. But we are seeing this growing list of jurisdictions saying that they're opposing it. One of the latest ones was the Washington County Sheriff's Office saying that they oppose the governor's mandate. We were hearing from other departments as well, Kyle, saying that they were going to emphasize education over citing. All right, Anushu Roy, thank you very much. Let's look at the testing situation. State processed 8,900 tests in the last day. They've been averaging about that for the last week, and it's a significant improvement over the clip from a few weeks ago. Our positivity rate did creep above the 5% threshold today. Our seven-day moving average on positivity is about 4.4%. Public health experts like to see that below 5% to indicate that there is a manageable level of undiagnosed cases floating around out there. 
The number of Coloradans hospitalized with COVID-19 is still creeping upward. 273 patients currently being treated in hospitals, 29 of them left in the last day. In terms of new cases, 618 new confirmed cases added to the total. Our seven-day average actually slowed a bit to 450 new cases a day. But that trend is unmistakable. It is not a spike. It is a steady increase. It's the protests. That's what's spreading the COVID-19. Say people who are generally opposed to the motivations of the Black Lives Matter protests. But is that assumption correct? Our Brian Wendland talked with a University of Colorado Denver professor who has actually researched looking for a link between the protests and the increase in COVID-19 cases. When protesters demanding justice for George Floyd gathered by the thousands in cities across the country, some feared it would lead to a spike in COVID-19 cases. But as the average 10-day incubation period for the virus came and went, the curve largely stayed flat. This is a little bit puzzling because we know that COVID-19 is something that is likely to be spread at, this, at these protests. Andrew Friedson is an assistant professor of economics at the University of Colorado, Denver. He's part of a team that tracked the relationship between Black Lives Matter protests and COVID-19 cases. That team published their findings in a paper that says the reason we haven't seen the protests lead to a spike in cases is social distancing. So what seems to be happening is this spike in avoidance behavior. The team mapped out where protests were and were not happening and found that COVID-19 rates in cities with protests did not climb faster than cases in cities without protests. They also used anonymous cell phone data to determine that while thousands of people may have gathered for protests in a given city, even more people decided to stay home than usual. And if the overall population is sheltering in place more, then what you could have is an offsetting effect that is sufficient to wipe out any transmission at the population level that happened at the protests. What does this all boil down to? Any uptick in COVID-19 cases that may exist among protesters has been offset by an even greater number of people who avoided crowds and stayed home. The big takeaway from this paper is that social distancing is incredibly valuable. For next, I'm Brian Wendland. An issue that existed long before COVID-19 is now being dealt with in part due to COVID-19 and the economic situation. All those old city ordinances about how many unrelated people can live in the same house. In Denver, the limit's two. In Boulder, the limit's three. Our Marshall Zellinger looks at what might be changing. It's an open secret, particularly in college towns. It helps us afford our mortgage. <laughs> Too many unrelated people living together, despite city laws setting limits, like Nat's living situation in Boulder. Right now, there are five of us, and during the school year, it's generally six of us. Boulder's limit is three unrelated people. We've told you about the group Bedrooms Are For People, trying to get a question on the November ballot in Boulder to make it one person per bedroom plus one more. Our household regulations are fairly outdated. In Denver, the limit limit is two unrelated people. The reason sounds as outdated as the limit. A provision that dates back to the, the 1980s uh, and was aimed at, you know, keeping unmarried couples or, or uh, same-sex couples from living together. Today, Denver's Community Planning and Development released its proposed changes after a two-year study, changing the limit from two to five. The limit goes up, the bigger the home. We're not proposing that, you know, people start uh, rooming in boarding houses. A, a household would still be required to be a group of people who have jointly chosen to occupy a place and are, uh, you know, on a, on, a, on a single lease. Last weekend, in an executive order, Governor Jared Polis strongly encouraged areas to suspend or eliminate restrictions on unrelated people living together. As he explained on Tuesday, he doesn't have much power in this area. One of the reasons uh, that uh, the state has less authority in this area is these are local ordinances. They're not, there's no state ordinance, and there's no state law to waive. Changes to the number of unrelated people living together could help those experiencing homelessness due to COVID-19 and those who might soon be facing eviction since Polis did not extend the executive order putting a moratorium on evictions. Denver's proposed changes from two to five and perhaps more is published on the city's planning website for 30 days. You can comment online. Boulder's potential ballot issue hit a hiccup. The timeline to collect signatures was off. Now it's either going to take city council or perhaps a lawsuit to get that on the ballot this year, Kyle. And I think I'm past the statute of limitations, but I should point out that when I was living in the town of Superior while at school at CU Boulder, twice 
I was living with more than what was allowed with uh, unrelated people. Superiors is limit is three. There was four in that house. I'm absolved. Oh, Marshall, the law and order crowd is not going to like that admission from you. The law and order people have some laws that they really like to see enforced. Except when you're dealing with college kids trying to scrap by and live together, I guess. Outside of Boulder. In Boulder, I don't, yeah. I don't know if I recommend that. But when you're outside of Boulder, I don't know. All right, Marshall it's selling your reporting. Thank you, Marshall. A final thought uh, for now on where Colorado stands in its fight against COVID-19. I really hope that our current and future choices honor the sacrifices that we have already made. Some people sacrifice their social lives. Some people sacrifice their livelihoods. More than 1,600 Coloradans lost their lives. It makes the momentary inconvenience of wearing a mask or skipping a social gathering seem pretty insignificant because those things are. Real people made real sacrifices to put Colorado in the pretty decent position that it's in today during the pandemic. What a shame it would be to throw it away out of what? Boredom? Frustration? Politics? Think of everything that's been done by the healthcare workers, by the senior living professionals, by the scientists, by all of the rest of us who made those individual day-by-day -day sacrifices because we decided that the health of our neighbors was worth protecting. Colorado has been spared the immense pain that is being felt in some other states, not because we're lucky or good, because of the choices that we made. Now, this is a state with a lot of pride, all right. I do hope, though, to, to turn that old proverb around that pride does not go before the rise, the rise in cases, the rise in the number of deaths. I really hope that our current and our future choices honor the sacrifices that we have already made. Their jobs are different. Their missions the same. Survive the pandemic. One organization has found a way to help both those groups do just that. A return from the fire line means back to the prison cell for some of our state's wildland firefighters. A look at whether they're being rewarded with opportunities for the risks they take on our behalf. Next. May I make a recommendation? I want to send you to another news organization's website for a story that I found really interesting this week. 5280 Magazine took a look at how Colorado trains prison inmates to fight wildland firefighters, but then those inmates can't get jobs fighting fires as a career once they get out of prison. Hudson Lindenberger's article examines this decades-old program. We've showed it to you a bunch of times on 9 News. It's turned 2,200 inmates into firefighters, but a state fire official said he thought that no more than five had been able to land firefighting jobs once they got out of prison. They're protecting our state for little pay. That's the deal, because they're in prison, but also for very little opportunity once they're on the outside. So is that fair? Check out that 5280 article. We put a link to it on the next Facebook page. and dry weather to end the week with temperatures this afternoon above average in the mid 90s triple digit highs on the eastern plains in western nebraska and kansas we'll see these numbers again tomorrow there's moisture coming in from the southwest and a 20 percent chance that we might see a brief shower from these storms tonight and again tomorrow but the trend is for record heat to kick off the weekend with a better chance of rain from storms on sunday and so tonight storms move out skies clear are low at 66 degrees hot dry tomorrow the high 98 i think the record is 99 we come close to that not as warm on sunday with a better chance of rain from storms upper 80s low 90s to kick off the new week have a great weekend when we started this show four years ago i did not know that it was going to get so weird so fast uh but you know what all those years later what we do together feels strangely normal, like how a next viewer, Jillian, decided to cross-stitch what I said earlier this week about anti-science elected officials basically saying, yee-haw, pass the Rona. It's really nice cross-stitch. Took her about two hours. Or, or the next viewer, Rindy, who found a log photo frame and then found the perfect image from next to put inside of it. Logs on logs. It's like there's like a couple hundred thousand of us that are in on this really awkward inside joke. 
and I think I'm fine with that. In Asian culture, feeding people shows that we care about them, so this is our way of showing our support. As they say, we're all in the same storm, but not in the same boat. Trying to keep a business alive using your second language, there is a local group that has a great idea to help. And the peaceful sound of nature. It's the most Colorado thing we heard today. Next. When we talk about restaurants hit hard during the pandemic, we can sometimes overlook the real small places. I'm talking about like the, the family owned restaurants that don't even have a website or, or social media to tell folks how they're coping with the pandemic. Then if you layer on to that, that some of these folks are not fluent English speakers, well, then there's a real struggle to deal with the current situation. There's an organization in town that's figured out a way to help both Asian restaurants and healthcare workers. It's your good news. I wake up at 7. I came over here like at 7 30. So you made 100 meals today? Yes. In my opinion, like uh, food is love. So I hope like I can give those food to the hospital people who work in the front lines. Hope you guys stay stronger. My sister and I, Tracy, started, founded um, Feed Your Hospital in our Denver chapter. We just wanted to do what we can to help those mom and pop shops and those immigrant owned families that aren't very tech savvy. Thank you, thank you. We're seeing a lot of slurs being thrown around here and there, and then just attributing this entire virus to our community. And we see that a lot of restaurants have been hit hard by this, and we just want to do what we can to help. We love calories, absolutely. We contact the hospital to understand the amount of people on a given shift. Thank you and so much. When we walk through those doors and come out of the OR and see those boxes that are piled up on the counters, uh, we're, we're amazed by the generosity of the community. It's kind of something to brighten our day, look forward to, uh, fill our stomachs definitely helps with the morale. We do get hungry after a busy day in the OR. In Asian culture, feeding people shows that we care about them. So this is our way of showing our support. It's made us feel very fortunate, very supported. It's hard to eat. Yeah. <laughs> mm, what a legitimately smart idea right there. So it's basically the sound of music, but with sheep. It's the most Colorado thing we saw today. That and a word about where I'll be for the next little while when we return. The most Colorado thing we saw today wasn't so much seen as heard and what we... Colorado Public Radio's Andy Kenny shared this today. It's a video that he shot in 2018 up in the San Juans. Sheep herding in that part of Colorado goes way back. And how to manage its impact on the land and on a wild sheep, it's often really controversial. There's a great article from the High Country News from a few years back talking about the sheep and their herders and sometimes that lonely life on the range. We have a link to that on the next Facebook page. A quick note uh, before we step away tonight, uh, I'm going to be away uh, for a, a bit to spend some more time with my family. Uh, expect to be back in early August. Dex is in great hands with all the people that you know around here. And I do want to say that our Word of Thanks microgiving campaign is going to continue while I'm gone. I'll be participating each week as a viewer and hope that you will be too. Gregory says, your views on our COVID fight brought me and my husband to tears. Thank you for your kind words and realistic view about what's going on. Colorado isn't magic. We have to be smart, people. 